Good morning, Grow Family. I'm so thankful that you guys have joined us this morning for our online worship service. Now, I'm not sure exactly where you're watching from. Maybe you're at your house sitting on your recliner, your favorite couch. Uh, maybe you're at your dining room table, or maybe you're still even in the bed. Doesn't matter where you're at. Um, either way, we're going to sing, and I want you guys to sing along with me. All right, so here we go. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus, give me
just wanna sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never wanna leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings You don't owe me anything But more than anything that you can do I just want you I'm sorry When I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sing another song And take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot the young love and take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught. online this morning. Now, we are online this week and next week, and really, man, did we not want to have to do this. I love being together with you uh, in person. I love our Sunday mornings. It just kind of, 
Um, it fuels me, and, and I've heard from others it fuels you. I mean, God did ordain fellowship and getting together, and so uh, I think that we're at our best when we're together, when we're joining together, especially on Sunday mornings, because that's the time where worship is an overflow and where you get our uh, tanks refilled, and uh, we love on one another, we encourage one another, we get in the Word together. And so this morning we're coming um, not uh, from uh, a face-to-face uh, uh, time together. In fact, it's online. And if you've noticed, it's a little bit different this morning. Normally when I have an online service on Sundays, uh, I'm in the church and we record there. However, uh, this week has been a little bit different. It's been a little bit different for a couple of reasons, uh, but namely because of COVID. Um, for the past several months, uh, more than, more than uh that we'd like to uh, really kind of look back at. But for this most of last year, we were uh, kind of in this weird COVID thing that was going on where we couldn't meet for a while, then we were able to meet for a while, and then we had a few things going on and a few things that couldn't happen. And um, really all the way through that, the Grove, ever since that we could get back together, we have been together, uh, minus a few exceptions, um, because really we, we don't want to have to cancel um, our in-person um, however, uh, we had to make the difficult decision uh, this week and next week um, after uh, you know calling several folks, getting a lot of wise counsel, praying together, uh, and we felt like uh, these next two weeks would be important for us to do online. Uh, we want you to engage with us. Uh, be here online with us through this message this morning, wherever you are, or maybe you're listening this evening. Um, and let's worship together as the church, because the building isn't the church. We are the church, but let's worship together until we can get back together. You may be saying, well, how did y'all come to this decision? Um, some people have already had COVID and you've recovered. you got the antibodies. You're um, okay with uh, going and being out and doing all those things. And, and we have been canceling uh, in the past when things were really rough. And you're exactly right. We didn't want to get to this point this Sunday. Uh, however, uh, we've had a couple of our staff that tested positive for COVID. Uh, this week. Um, and so for the most part of this week, uh, me and several other of our staff were uh, in quarantine until we could go get checked. Um, there's a time to that. You can't just run off and uh, get checked because you were around somebody instantly. In fact, they want you to wait, wait a few days. So uh, we had to go quarantine. And uh, I'm glad to say um, this morning I am negative of COVID. I don't have, I don't have COVID. Um, but because of that, it kind of put everything in kind of a different uh, form this week. And so we begin to look at, you know, we got a couple of staff members that have COVID, so they weren't going to be able to be there. We have several in our church family right now uh, who have COVID and uh, several that are recovering from COVID. Um, and, and we're seeing, you know, some some upticks a little bit because of the holidays. And um, they're saying that maybe that may even get worse this week and next week. We don't know. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. Uh, you don't know. Um, and so it was just a lot of variables. We said, okay, hey, Let's not be cavalier this week and next week. Uh, let's take away some of those opportunities uh, for us to expose one another, uh, our friends, our family, our community to this uh, virus, and hopefully play the long ball game where uh, if we can do our part right now, then hopefully we can um, you know, kind of see the end of this come very soon, especially with the vaccine coming. So uh, we're going to give these next two weeks to kind of let everything kind of uh, our staff to recover and, and get back to health. We need JT singing. Uh, and leading us in worship on Sunday morning, uh, and a couple other guys. Uh, but uh, while we do that, it allows you and your family to do what you need to do uh, to protect you guys. Um, and then hopefully very soon we will uh, just just be right back to normal. I, I would love for it to be uh, some semblance of normal, even though we know uh, it won't ever be exactly like it was um, before, um, but we are working towards it. So this morning we're coming to you online, and I'm actually coming to you from my study at home. Uh, we decided to do that because JT does have COVID, so he couldn't be at the church. And we had uh, our audio and visual team that was trying to figure out how to do it. And I said, hey, listen, uh, we've not done this before on Sunday morning. Let's do it from my house on Sunday morning. Uh, it makes it feel a little more uh, personable, I think. Um, and then we will be back at the church together in two weeks. So uh, I'm coming to you from my own study. Now, you may say, can he teach this way? Well, I have been. Uh, I've done it uh, a little bit last year, and um, I'm doing it this morning, so it's going to be fine. So get your Bibles. We're going to be together in Philippians and in Matthew, and I want to talk about one subject um, this morning. I want to talk about treasuring Jesus. Last week, I started off our series uh, talking about treasures, um, and this week, I was actually supposed to start talking about the family. However, I want to save that for face-to-face, -face. so we'll start that in two weeks, but I want to talk about treasuring Jesus this morning. Um, I'm going to say something to you, and I don't know um, 
how you feeling. I don't know what you're going through. It has been a week. Man, it has been a wild week. Um, I think some most of us that are my age and older uh, would say we've never really seen a week like this. I mean, we were already on our heels uh, with COVID, and then we saw what happened at our nation's capital, uh, and then just what all is going on in politics, and it has been a majorly confusing, uh, difficult week for a lot of folks. And I don't know how you're feeling this morning. I don't know if you're down, if you're frustrated, if you're angry, uh, if you're excited. I don't, I don't know where you are, and I'm not going to wait off into the uh, political world, but I am going to say this. We are living in some very perilous times, some times where the world needs Jesus more than they even know. Um, and I think, you know, what the Bible teaches us is extremely uh, on point for right now. A house divided will fall. And we've probably never been as divided as we are. Maybe there's been some times that we were uh, more divided than we are now, but it'd be hard-pressed to find some of those times. But as a country, we're as divided as we've ever been. And it's going to take you know, strong leadership. It's going to take a lot of um, people looking uh, to Christ to heal this. Um, these kind of answers don't come from uh, anything that we're going to find in politics or political leaders, uh, these answers only come from heaven. It only comes from Jesus Christ. And unfortunately for a lot of us, and I, I want to encourage you with this, can I? I want to encourage you. A lot of us, um, as we're walking through life, we end up getting kind of tangled up in some of this stuff. We end up getting tangled up in stuff that, listen, it will not last. Uh, it will not end up edifying you in any way. Uh, you say, well, this is my life. This is my freedom. This is my country. Yes, it is, but it's not your home. Your home is in heaven. And the Bible says we have to be really careful. A soldier of Christ doesn't get entangled in the things of the world because it trips you up. It gets you hung up. It becomes a distraction. Uh, we end up talking about things that, that don't really matter. We end up hating each other when we don't really need to hate each other. We got more in common than we do that distracts us from one another. Yet we get kind of tangled up in all these things. And so what happens is, is on our way to heaven, instead of having our eyes focused on Christ and on heaven and what he wants us to do in our lives, we get our eyes focused on this earth and the things that are going on, the things that we cannot fix, um, but we can look to Christ and allow him to use us to love one another and in that love, unify us as people. And so I want to encourage you with that this morning. If you're down, if you're frustrated, if you're distracted, if you're anxious, if you're worried, if you're whatever you are, uh, let's raise our eyes to heaven. And let's keep our eyes focused on where our home is so that we might be used by Christ in this earthly realm. you got to remember, the prince of the power of this air is still alive and well. He's destructive. He's mean. He's vicious. And all he wants to do is turn us into people who hate one another. Remember what the Bible says? Uh, we once, believers, we once were uh, by nature children of wrath. And you think about that and you look at what else going on. Uh, let's not revert back to that. And so I want to encourage you this morning, uh, whatever your political identity is, regardless of what you're feeling uh, about right now, don't give up and don't be discouraged. Raise your eyes to heaven because Jesus Christ is on his throne. Now, the only way that we can do that is if we treasure Christ. And the only way that we can treasure Christ is if our eyes are on Christ. Don't let things distract you from the main thing, which is Jesus Christ. He created you to do great things for him, good works that you would walk in, uh, is what Ephesians says. That's He saved you and he created these good works for us to walk in. And Paul talks to us about those in Philippians. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, here's what he says. He says, more than, I, more than that, I count all things, verse 8, in case you're wondering. Normally I'd have you stand. We'd read it together, but I'm not going to stand up here in my study. It took me forever to get this camera all situated and the lighting and all that other kind of stuff. And I'm no video guy. Uh, but he says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, think, you, think about that for just a minute. Uh, Paul said he set his sights on the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, his Lord. So he combated uh, things that he had lost. He combated the things that he was uh, looking at. He combated the things that were pulling on him, the things that were in his past, uh, his best days in the past, all the glory that went along with it. He said, I combated everything that I'm going through. And he's talking to the people of Philippi. Remember what I shared with you last week, if you heard the message. Uh, this is a church that's being persecuted. This is a church that's dealing with extreme poverty. This is a church that is going through some different different things. Uh, they're worried. They got infighting. The, the letter of, of Philippians talks about some infighting that's going on. And Paul goes, hey, listen, 
Uh, here's a leadership tip. If you want to move past those things, you've got to put your eyes on something else. And he says, I'm putting my eyes on the surpassing value. There's something that is so great, so valuable that it outshines what I'm focused on now. And that thing that is so great is Jesus Christ. He says, if you want to get your eyes off the world, if you want to get your eyes off what's holding you back, you want to get your eyes off what's got you irritated, if you want to get your eyes off what you're fussing about, if you want to get your eyes off all those other things, he says, you do that by putting your eyes on Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as we get together, that's what we want to do. We want to put our eyes on Jesus Christ and the value of knowing him. He says, listen, not just looking at him, but let's get to know him. It's one thing to, to look at Christ and focus on Christ. It's another thing to get to know and experience Christ. And that's what he says. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all but rubbish. Uh, that sounds like a good uh, biblical word, doesn't it? Uh, rubbish. Uh, it sounds a little uh, Irish to me this morning, but w whatever. Uh, rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And he says, listen, I am finding uh, and found him and found the righteousness uh, of him, not because of what I did, but because of what he does. It's not about me uh, keeping the law and all the do's and the don'ts. It's about what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of in Christ Jesus. And then he says in verse 13, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching for what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he says, listen to me, God has created in me a purpose, and I have a calling on my life that I want to reach towards. That's why this is so important this morning that we talk about treasuring Jesus Christ. It's because we have been created to do something fantastic for Christ. Every single person that listens to, to these words, every single person that's ever been born, every single person, no matter whether you're old or you're young, no matter if you've seen your greatest days and think you'll never see them again, whether you've sinned or been sinned against, whether you've done something that you regret or you uh, feel like you haven't lived at all, no matter who you are, Christ has created you for a purpose, a calling. And here's what Paul says. Paul says, I am reaching towards that calling, the upward call of Christ on my life, right? That is what I'm reaching for. That's the goal and the prize. That's the effort and the result of the effort is that I would achieve what God has created me for. Let me ask you a question this morning before we go any further. What did God create you for? And what is your purpose? Uh, don't get, don't, listen, listen, don't give up on the fact that God has a purpose for you. And then he says these words as we wrap up Philippians. He says, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, many saved, we know there's nobody perfect, right? Um, have this attitude. This, this is the attitude that we have to have. And if anything you have, in, in, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. He says this, here's, here's the way, is we have to have an attitude. And that attitude has to be focused on Jesus Christ. Our eyes and our attitude have to be on Christ. When all this other stuff, all this commotion, all these distractions, all these things that make us bite our fingernails, all these things, the COVID, the politics, the, the capital, all these things that we're going, and we've had a lot jam-packed into one week. I mean, who would have thought last week uh, when we had our uh, first real message of the year to this week, so much would have happened in one week. Who would have thought that? And then myself, I was putting, you know, quarantine time out and was a, a, a raving madman stuck in the house. I, it, it doesn't suit me. That's not who I am. I like to be out amongst people and helping people and helping meet needs. That's what I really thrive on. So being stuck here in this house all week has really uh, wore me out. And then being unable to meet with you in person this week, it's really, but here's what he says. He says, don't let that change your attitude. Your attitude has to be one of this. I'm forgetting what was behind me. I'm reaching to what's before me. And I'm doing it with a view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ. 
and I am pressing towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of Christ on my life. That is the purpose and that is the attitude. What are you into? I'm into doing what God created me to do. Uh, what are you going to do to make that happen? I'm going to do anything that he wants me to do to get there. Uh, whatever that goal is, whatever that, uh, that, that prize is, whatever that calling is, I'm selling out to it. My eyes aren't going to get distracted. I'm not getting in this pit to argue with uh, uh, you about this or that. I'm not going to be distracted. Why? How? How can you not be distracted? Because I am focused on what Christ has called me to do. Uh, life is short, you guys. Life is but a vapor, is what the Bible says. It's but a vapor. In a few weeks, I turned 42. And it's crazy to me, because a lot of you are maybe watching me going, now, boy, I wish I was 42. That's young. Uh, and it may be compared to where you are in life. But I look back and I think, man, it wasn't just long, too long ago when I was in high school or in college or started my first ministry, uh, just getting married, whatever it might be. And life literally flies by. And it seems like every year as I walk through my house or go to church or do whatever I do, there's another face that's gone, another another person that I used to do life with that's no longer around. Uh, life is but a vapor. And all these things begin to attack and they begin to come uh, from all directions, whether it's in your marriage, it's with your children, it's in addiction, it's in finances, it's with your health, and it sucks the life out of us. And before you know it, because of the things that are going on in our life and around our life, the circumstances, our eyes get lowered from heaven and what God's called us to do. And he's saved us and we're excited about that. And he's given us this song in our heart and we're excited about that. And he has uh, challenged us and given us these dreams and we're pumped about it. And we talk to people and say, man, I got a dream. And slowly, uh, the enemy knows if he assaults us enough with just life. I'm talking about just life. Talking about mess-ups and failures and ego, attitudes, distractions, arguments in marriage, frustrations over here, disappointment over there. We will begin to lower our eyes. And our eyes will be focused on the things that we literally have no control over. We will find ourselves retreating in fear. We'll find ourselves retreating in anger. We'll find a spirit of unsettledness in us that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It's an unsettled spirit of the flesh. And we try to settle that spirit. We try to fix that spirit. We try to achieve that, whether we uh, have outburst of anger or whether we indulge in a sin or whatever it might be to satisfy that. And yet Paul goes, listen, you can't live facing backwards. You have to live facing forwards. And as you live facing forward, you don't focus on what's right in front of you. You focus on what's above you. And that's the surpassing value of Jesus Christ and knowing him. And not only do you do that, but you work every single day of your life with an attitude that says, I will reach towards the prize of God's upward call on my life. Now, let me ask you a question while you're sitting there this Sunday morning, and I've only got a few minutes with you. If everybody that you know, when you got together, instead of talking about what was going on around and this, and did you hear this, and all this other kind of stuff, and then instead of talking about all the stuff that has us down in the mouth, and you know, all these things, but if we were all encouraging one another to what God's called you to do, if we're all talking about the upward call of God in our life, if we're like, what, what the Bible say, iron sharpens iron. If every time we were getting together, it was just like a bunch of iron clanging together, man. And we were talking about, man, I feel like God's called me here. And I feel like God's called me to this. And God's working in my marriage to do this. And God's working in my children. And God's working in my parents. And man, this is what God laid on my heart. And this is what I really just sense God doing uh, this week in my life. And I was spending time in prayer with him. And this is what he was sharing with me. And I, I just had a, uh, a friend text me uh, not too long ago and just said, you know, during this time I was thinking about uh, not going forward with an education that they had. They were just going to let it go. Uh, but as they begin to think about it and pray about it, they realized they needed to re-up that and they needed to press into that because uh, instead of getting caught up in what is now, it looks like all the doors are shut, right behind that there may be a huge opportunity. And so they were so excited and I celebrated with them. I was so proud of them because they pushed through during this time to make sure that their education level uh, and the licenses that go along with it would still be there when these doors open up. You know why? You know why they wanted to do that? Because they said, I don't know what Christ has, 
behind the door. But I'm praying that it's an opportunity to do something for him. And the greatest way that I can do something for him, listen to this, is to be prepared for the thing that I don't even see yet. Now that is what it's all about. That's the attitude. Not not all this other stuff. Folks, all this other stuff will pass away. All this other stuff is going to go away. Don't, don't. No, our attitude is here. So how do we do it? Well, uh, Jesus said it uh, a certain way. And Jesus said it was this way. You, you really have to hear what he said because he's saying this. He said, it really comes down to your heart. It really comes down to your heart. And Christ begins to share this in a way. Now, Paul called it a prize, and Jesus is going to call it a treasure. All right? But I asked you a couple of questions last week to kind of get our minds shifted towards what our treasure is. Here was the questions I asked you. I wrote them down again uh, for you, and you probably already got them too. But uh, number one question last week, and, and we asked this morning, is this, what is the vision for your year? What's your vision this year? Um, what, what, do you, what do you see? What, what's in your view? Uh, Paul said uh, the, the, the surpassing, his view is of the surpassing uh, understanding of Christ and to get to know him, the value of Christ. So what's your vision? Maybe your vision is in your family. Maybe your vision is to work on your marriage. Maybe your vision is to get married. Uh, maybe your vision is to heal up from a broken relationship. Or maybe this year was so hard um, for a lot of different reasons. And so your vision this year is to grow in strength emotionally, mentally, physically. Uh, maybe it is to apply yourself. Uh, for several years, um, I didn't really know what I want to do as far as continuing my education. I've really stepped out into a lot of different avenues and considered several different uh, things. Um, and, you know, it was one of those things where I really couldn't get settled on. I couldn't find peace. I have my master's, but I, I really wanted to think through maybe a Ph.D. or a doctorate of um, uh, psychology or whatever it might be. How, how could I help people the best? But uh, what I found was is in those years as I was looking, God was refining me until my vision became clear. My vision became clear, and I'm closer now than I've ever been. And hopefully this year, my, my vision is this year, uh, I will pass uh, the state uh, exam to have my license so that I can be a licensed uh, drug and alcohol counselor. Uh, that's the way I feel like God has uh, wired me uh, and changed my heart that I may be able to help the most people. I end up uh, helping folks with that a lot, helping them find the resources that they need or encouraging them or leading a class or whatever it might be. But I want to take that a step further where it could be very practical and tangible so that I could, I could do that. And so I've been working toward that. And so part of my vision this year is to achieve that to get that done. And I'm real close, and hopefully 2021 is going to be the year for that. Um, but again, that's that's not a vision that I have about my ego. And I really had to die of that because part of my ego really wanted to be called doctor, right? That's part of uh, you know, uh, the ego to have that. But uh, as I began to work, I was I found that I was working for something for me as opposed to something for Christ that Christ could use. Not that he couldn't use that thing, and, and a lot of people do, and there's nothing bad or wrong with it. It's just where I am now that God said, this is what I really want you to do, and this is where I can make most of, of myself through you. So that's part of my vision. And so maybe that's part of your vision is to get up and uh, get back on that horse of education. It may be uh, to apply yourself more to Scripture. You want to study more. You want to learn more. What is the vision of Christ for your life this year? And then number two, we ask this question, what do you need to lay down or quit carrying into the future? What is it that was going on in 2020 in your life? What is it that you went through? What is it that you were struggling with? What is it that was done to you uh, or that you did to somebody else? Maybe it's a sin uh, in your life. Maybe it's a struggle in your life. Uh, maybe it didn't happen in 2020. Maybe it happened years before, but you've just been kind of been carrying it, carrying it, carrying it, carrying it. It's kind of your little, your little drum beat, and, and I'm not being insensitive because I've done it, and maybe you've done it, but it's just kind of what we carry on. And we find that every year comes and goes, and we still kind of keep carrying this thing. What this year do you need to forget what lies behind you? Let it go and lay it down. Stop dragging that with you. You can't change it. You have to trust Christ with it. So lay it down at the cross. So I want to know what my vision is. What is it that I need to lay down? What is it that I need to finally let go of, uh, whether that's forgive or forget about or just let go uh, so that Christ can uh, heal me and make me what he wants me to be. And then number three, we ask this, um, where is Christ trying to get you to this year? And that's a great question to have. See, you may be thinking about vision, and vision would be what do you see that God's doing in your life? What is the vision for your life? But but here's where vision becomes refined. Vision becomes refined. Now, you want to get a leader, leadership tip this morning? Well, you, you're in my study. Come on in here. Um, I am a leader, 
Uh, I'm not the best leader, uh, and but but by the nature of my uh, role, I'm a leader in different capacities. I lead my family. I lead my children. Uh, I'm a leader in our church. I'm a leader in the community in different aspects or whatever. You're a leader. You're a leader in your home. You're a leader in the community. Everybody has leadership. But if you want to know, here here's a little leadership tip for you. A vision becomes refined when you begin to look at not only what you see uh, and, and where you see yourself going, but when you see where Christ is trying to take you. It's one thing for me to say, this is what I want to do. It's another thing for me to say, this is where I feel Christ is taking me. Because now the director of that vision, it becomes refined. This is what I'd love to do, right? But as I turn that vision over to Christ and I go, this is what I'd love to do, but this is where Christ is taking me. See, sometimes in our vision, vision begins to move. It's real fluid because uh, depending on who's driving a boat, uh, let me drive the boat, right? I, I mean, if, if, if I am driving that, man, there's no telling where I would be or what I would be doing. Um, there was a time in my life where all I want to do was sell cars, right? Um, so uh, that was the vision of my life. But as I began to say, where is Christ trying to take me? Uh, I realized that Christ, that was not the vision that Christ had for my life. Uh, the vision that Christ had for me was to get me into ministry full time. And that was in a local church. There was a time where, uh, okay, I'll do the ministry part, but I want to be an evangelist or I want to be an itinerant speaker and not spend a lot of time in a local church because um, that's where uh, it gets real messy real quick. And yet, uh, as I said, well, this is where Christ wants me to go. Where do you, where do you want me to be? Christ gave me a, a heart for the local church. So uh, vision, right? What am I letting go of? And then where do I feel like Christ is take, taking me? Uh, where does Christ want me to uh, get to this year? And that's the word that we use reach for. He says reaching for, well, Isaiah, that word reach means stretch. I anytime you turn the vision of your life over to Christ, listen to me, write that, put, oh, I'm spitting gold this morning in the study. Anytime that you turn the vision of your life over to Jesus Christ, I say, where, Christ, where do you want me to get, get to? Where, where are you leading me? You, you need to get ready for stretching. You, you need to get ready to stretch. That word reach that Paul uses has the idea of stretching a muscle to its maximum capacity. It's like working out. It's like a runner who uh, is uh, creating long strides. Uh, whenever Christ is given the, the steering wheel of vision, for your life, I'm telling you, you're going to be stretched because Jesus is wanting to make the best out of us. He wants to get the best out of us. And what do you know about that? Here's what you know. is in the process of Christ taking us to where he wants us to be is a refining moment. And when you find yourself in the refining of life, it's painful because you lose things. You add things on to. You go through trials. Sometimes you go through uh, different seasons of your life. And it's a stretching. And so we go from our vision, and we go down to letting go of certain things. I can't take this into the future with me. It's the thing that's keeping me from becoming everything I need to be. That's in the past, and I'm moving to the future. And then Jesus, you, listen, where do you want to get me to? How, how are you going to stretch me this year? Right? And then number four was this. Uh, what is your treasure? Uh, what, what is your treasure? What, what is the prize uh, this year? What's the goal in the prize? And so we would continue to, to continue to refine this down. What's the prize? He says the goal and the prize. The goal is the effort put towards the prize. The prize is the result of the effort. And so we want to get to this prize by putting forth this effort. Uh, I want to lose 20 pounds by eating healthy. And if I eat healthy, the goal, uh, if I eat healthy, it will give me the prize of being 20 pounds down. Uh, that's how we have to think of this. This is my pride. This at the end of this year, this is what I see. And at the end of this year, I see me uh, being that counselor licensed by the state. I see my marriage being stronger than it ever has been. Um, I see my uh, my leadership with my children uh, finally becoming the the Christian leader that I need to be for my children. Um, I, I find myself having a ministry in the local community. I find myself being educated and going back to school. Whatever that prize is. A prize will be determined on whether you meet the goal. And the goal is the effort that you're going to put towards the prize. Which leads us to number five question. And that is this. What is your why and your how? Easily put is this. It's a why and a how. When we talk about goal and prize, it's a why and a how. 
Uh, your why is why you're doing what you're doing. It's the, it's the prize, right? We want to see people saved. That's the why. We want to see Jesus lifted up. That's the why. We want to make much of Christ in Rome County. That's the why, right? And if that's the prize, if, if the why is make much of Jesus, then the how is, it don't matter. It has to fit into this final picture of making much of Jesus. So whatever we do, this how is to make much of Jesus. It's like uh, one old person, you say this, you say this, you can deal with almost any how, right? If you understand the why, you can deal with almost any how. So if your why is your family, your marriage, uh, your health, your whatever, how you get there doesn't matter. That, that, that's irrelevant. It's the why that matters. That's what I'm determined and focused on. So our vision starts at the top, and it works its all way down into two simple terms, why and how. Jesus said it this way, it's your treasure. And he said it like this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth rust destroy and where thieves break in or steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus makes it just real, real, real simple. Your why will have your heart. Your why will have your heart. Where your why is, there your heart will be. Paul said, where your prize is, there your heart will be. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. You can't achieve any why, any prize, any treasure. Whatever it is, listen to me, please focus right here. Whatever it is that you want to see happen, whatever the vision is and what you're letting go of and what Jesus is trying to get you to, right? All these things, you'll never achieve it till your heart's in it. And the only way your heart can be in it is if you treasure it. It has to be something that has extreme uh, value to you. It, it must be uh, valued above everything else. And when you value something above everything else, it has your heart. Uh, I, I put in my notes, uh, whatever you set as your treasure will steal your heart. Uh, it's why you see people um, uh, do crazy things for things that they love, right? Uh, sometimes you turn on TV and you watch ball games. There'll be ball games on this afternoon, and you'll see people, well, if they can get into the stadium. Uh, but if they're in the stadium, you see them dressed up crazy, you go, why do you, who dresses like that? Um, and you would say something like this, well, I like football too, but I ain't acting like that. Why? Well, that's because that's their treasure, that's their goal, that's their why. And so they dress up. They do crazy stuff. It has their heart, right? Uh, if you're in love with somebody, um, they have your heart. You treasure them, uh, and you'll do anything for them. But we have to understand treasures will steal your heart. Hobbies that you end up treasuring will steal your heart. Uh, uh, money, it will steal your heart. Uh, other things, distraction, that will steal your heart because that's what you treasure. Uh, I put this too in here. If you don't treasure it, and write this here. If you don't treasure it, your heart won't be in it. Uh, if you don't treasure it, your heart won't be in it. I, I, I don't mind to tell you, uh, if your heart's, um, if, if, you, if you don't treasure your church or your church family, your heart won't be in it. You give up. You walk away. You're in and you're out. You're halfway committed. How can you be halfway committed to something? You're halfway committed because your heart's not in it. Why is your heart not in it? Philip, I just don't know why my heart's not in it anymore. Because you don't treasure it. That's, it's easy. That's, it's an easy answer. And I didn't give it to you. Jesus gave it to you. Your heart's not in it because you don't treasure it. If you, if you treasure something, your heart's in it. Oh, boy, and listen to me. If your heart's in it, then it's dangerous. Because you'll do anything uh, for what uh, your heart wants. You remember what they say sometimes. What the heart wants is what the heart wants. And what the heart wants it normally is what the heart gets. And so the only way that you can walk away from a relationship, the only way that you can walk away from a job, the only way that you can walk away from a ministry, the only way you can walk away from a relationship that uh, you've been a part of for a long time or a friendship or walk away from whatever, whatever is because your heart's no longer in it. And conversely, if your heart's no longer in it, then it means that you don't treasure it anymore. See, sometimes when we're trying to talk people into uh, having their heart in this, right? Uh, if, if you if you got a team and a coach is begging the team to try, but they're not giving any effort, 
What you're really trying to get them to do is to treasure whatever that thing is like you treasure it. I need you to feel about this the way I feel. I'd give everything I have. But you won't. Why? Because your heart's not in it. And so we have to be real careful what our treasures are because they will steal our heart. And we have to be real careful that we feed our treasures because it's what keeps our heart in it. A treasure will steal your heart. And if it's not your treasure, you will lose your heart. Something will have your heart. So the question is, is what do we treasure? Well, that's when we came down and we said we have three treasures this year. And I want to challenge you with the first one this morning. Is our three treasures. We're going to treasure Jesus. We're going to treasure people. And we're going to treasure the gospel. But this morning I want to ask you this. Is Jesus your treasure? Is he your treasure? I, I mean, really. Come on now. Come on. We live in the South. I'm from the South. We're in the Bible Belt. Is Jesus your treasure? Does he have your heart? Is your heart in it? Do you love him? Do you love him above all others? How do you treasure Jesus? Well, I want to give you a couple of things here. Uh, the Bible says this, uh, as we think about treasuring Jesus, and hopefully you'll make notes here real quick, quickly, and I'm going to do this very briefly and be uh, done and kick you out of my office and let you enjoy your Sunday. Um, but the Bible says this, Matthew 22, 37 says, And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the greatest commandment. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. And you hear the passion. These are This is not a new understanding. You know, you know these words. But let's just get real here. Do you love God with all your heart? Do you? I'm pausing for a second because you really need to take inventory here. I can be honest with you. I've been a believer for a long time, ever since I was a little boy, right? I prayed and, and I turned my life over to Christ. I tell people all the time, I did my greatest sinning after I accepted Christ. I was young uh, when I got saved. I did my greatest sinning after Christ. I'm so thankful for His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness. But I'm going to be honest with you. There have been seasons in my life where Christ, I did not love Him with all my heart. I didn't. I love the idea of him. I love what he blessed me with. I love the fact that I was going to heaven. But I didn't love him with all my heart. See, when he has my heart, then I treasure him. And it's real simple. If he has your heart, he'll get your soul and your mind. Right? He doesn't say, love the Lord your God with all your mind, and then your soul, and then your heart. No, no, no. He gets your heart first. And then he gets your soul. It's who you become. Right? Have you ever noticed anything? Get your heart. It's who you become. What has your heart? It'll change the way you dress. It'll change the way you talk. If you ever had a mentor or a role model, and you know, she kind of, when I first started preaching, I didn't know how to preach, so I had a favorite preacher. He's a mentor. I spent a lot of time with him, and I'd find that when I'd go into the pulpit and preach, I sounded like him. He had a way of pointing his finger, and I can still see it today. He, he was a little tall, slender guy, red hair, and he was a friend of mine, and it just, he's the only guy I've ever really paid attention to pe preaching, but when he would preach, he would point his finger, especially when he talked about sin, and he'd point it right at you like this. You see how like that? He would point. That's how it felt like from the straight stage. Like He was just pointing it right in you. So when I was get up to preach, I would I would change the way, and, and the way I did, he had some of these moves, and I would change it, and I'd preach, and I'd point, and I'd preach, and I'd do this, and hi, yeah, I'd do it, and tell his jokes. Because he had my heart, it's what I knew. See, it's what you become. And then, watch, Jesus is so good. See, what has your heart determines who you become as your soul, and it determines what your mind thinks about. Right? Determines what your mind thinks about. And so we want to love him. That. That's how we treasure him. The Bible goes on and says, Colossians 3.17, so that makes sense. Well, if I get that part right, then this really takes effect. And whatever you do in word or deed, do we do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here's what, if he's in my heart and I treasure him, and now he's become everything that I am in my soul and my mind is with him, then guess what It begins to happen? Everything that I do is for Jesus Christ. That's, how, that's what treasuring looks like. Everything I do. Everything. What does everything mean? Everything. From getting up to going to bed, everything I do for is for Christ. You say, man, I don't know how I do that. I mean, I, come on, man. I mean, how are you going to do everything for Christ? I mean, like eating? Yeah. Yeah. Eat for Jesus. Right? Take care of yourself. 
Take care of your body. Give him glory for it, right? Whatever you do, do it for Jesus Christ. Because he has my heart. I'm treasuring him. And so now everything I do. See, see, this is why my eyes are going to be up here. When my eyes get down here caught up in all this garbage that's going on around here, guess what happens? I get angry. I get frustrated. I get mad. And I do all this other kind of stuff. I'm not doing it for Christ. I'm doing it for me. What I deserve. Me. Me. Right? That's how my eyes come down. So I keep my eyes up. Surpassing value of knowing Christ. And everything I do, I do for him. Right? Uh, number three is this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all things will be added unto you. Here's a beautiful promise, is if Christ is my treasure and has my heart, he encompasses and my soul, right? It is well with my soul. I am, I'm becoming like Christ, and my mind is with him, and everything I'm doing for him. Listen to me. When I seek him first, everything else gets added unto you, unto me. I see it over and over and over. People get aggravated with people. They, they seem to be blessed more than... It doesn't even make sense, or they do this or whatever, and you're going, I don't understand why that's happening. Is it possible that they're seeking first Christ? And by the very nature of the promise, Christ is adding to them. He's adding things to their life. He's giving them opportunities. He's opening doors for them. He's creating avenues for them. See, the thing he had to get right first was seeking Christ. And now that I'm seeking Christ, everything else will be added unto you, Right? Maybe instead of just bagging on people because it seems like they're always getting the opportunity, they're always doing this. Listen to me. Maybe we need to go what their secret is. Their secret may be, if they're a believer, their secret may be that they're seeking Christ first and his kingdom. And then he's the one that's adding. See, because we will see that and we'll try to go out and in jealousy and envy, try to get what they've got and do what they do. And it never really pans out and we feel left. I mean, it just never really works out. Why? What was the secret? Seeking Christ first. Then everything else get added unto you. Stop worried about adding the stuff first. See Christ first. He'll add it to you. And then Jesus said it this way. Now I'm going to wrap this thing up. Matthew 13 through 44 says this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. We want to treasure Christ. It's like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found, and he covered it up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys the field. Do you know what it's like to find Jesus? Here's what it is. Here's what it is to treasure Jesus. Jesus tells you right here, this is what it's like. He said, there's an old boy who's walking through a field. And he's in this field. And he finds a treasure. It's in the field. Now, he don't own the field. He don't own the treasure. But the treasure is there. So what's he do? He takes the treasure and he puts it back down in the earth. He covers it up. And he says, I've got to own the field. Because if I own the field, I get the treasure. And the Bible says for the joy that's in it. Can you see him? He's walking back into town. He's walking back to his place going, I, I, I mean, I can't take no more. This is unbelievable. This is incredible. I found this treasure. He says for joy. You know what joy is? Joy is this, the emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying, keen pleasure or elation. And as we study it, we know that joy is the thing that, uh, that makes us content or holds things together. This guy out of joy, says, I got to have the field. He gets rid of everything he has. Remember, forgetting what life by? He sold everything he had to buy the field to get the treasure. That's what it means to treasure Christ. It means to find something that's so, can you, can you, can you, can you, this, oh man, I wish I could just climb through the screen. I know I'm probably, I don't know, maybe at your kitchen table, in your living room, on the car riding down the road. Some of y'all just probably just got out of bed and turned this on, so you're laying there. Listen to me. I wish I could just grab you by the shoulders and go, this is what it means to treasure Christ. I'm getting such elite, elevated pleasure out of Jesus that I'm willing to let go of everything else. And I'm going to buy the old field just to have the treasure. That's joy. It's when you look at your life and you go, i got to have him. I gotta have Jesus. And you get rid of everything else. My eyes have gotta be up here. I'm not, I'm not dealing with all. I'm, no, I, I, I'm selling it all. Just give me Jesus, man. Remember that old song we used to sing when we were in kids growing up in church? Some church still singing. It's a good old hymn. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Y'all remember that? That's this guy. That's how you treasure Christ. So, how are you gonna treasure Christ? Let me give you these. Thing. How can we treasure Christ this year? A couple of little practical things. Number one is just make time for him in your daily life. More than just Sundays. This morning should just be an overflow. Right? 
but make time for Christ daily. Number two is give him your thoughts. Put your, put your mind in heaven. Give Christ your thoughts. Uh, if, if Christ had your thoughts, would you be thinking what you're thinking right now? Give him your thoughts. And number two, give him your tithes. You, should, you say, oh, I knew you were going to come around to talking about giving. Listen, ministry's got to happen. Ministry's going on. You don't even realize this, maybe, uh, but over the Christmas uh, break, on Christmas, on Christmas there's a person in our community that um, their house burnt down. And as people were trying to help them, the only person they could get a hold of was me. And because they know what the Grove is all about, they called and said, we got a situation on Christmas night. And uh, I was able to, as your pastor, get up and go, meet them at a hotel, put them up for the evening. You were able to, because of your giving, to take care of them for the week. You were able to provide food for them for the week. You were able to provide clothing for them. We had a couple of other folks in our church that raised up. And, and, and because of some networks with a couple other churches that raised up to provide them the things that they needed. That's why we talk about giving. And see, this morning, some of y'all are going to say, well, we're not meeting at the church, so I don't need to give. No, you need to give now more than you ever have. I give my tithes and my offerings. Remember what the old boy said one time? He said, I don't give because I don't know where my money's going. And the other boy looked at him and said, I give because I don't know where my money's going. What a great perspective to have. The Grove has got to be the most generous church in the community. And you all, you can only become the most generous church by giving. And you don't become generous by being rich. You become generous by being generous. So let me encourage you to give to Christ. It's one of the ways that we treasure. You put your money towards what you treasure. So do you treasure him? This morning you can give online. I want to encourage you to do that. Go to Push Pay and to give this morning. Uh, to give towards the efforts of what's going on. We're building uh, but we building is only part of it. It's a huge expense, but it's only part of it. Uh, we give every every week so that others can be fed and clothed and taken care of. So let's give. Uh, let, we we uh, we, we uh, make Christ our treasure this year by commitment. If He has your heart, you'll be there. So commit your heart to Him. Be committed. Maybe 2021 is the year that you say we're going to be committed to Christ first, and then everything else. I know for me and my family, we have to watch that because there's other things that we could be more committed to. But I want to be committed to Christ first and then everything else. Let's be committed to him. Not halfway, not one foot in, one foot out. Let's be committed. Uh, then, then here's another way that we're going to treasure Christ is by prayer. Uh, we want to pray. Th listen, uh, we, we need to be people of prayer. Uh, it's real easy if Christ doesn't have your heart to be a, a person of opinions. Uh, there's always somebody that's got an opinion. We live in a world that's just, I mean, taking opinions and put them on steroids because they can go anywhere at any time against anybody. And you don't even have to show your face or even have a real account. You can just do it by fake. But what if we took that much time to pray and we become a person of prayer? Listen to me. Prayer isn't just talking. Prayer is listening. Maybe we don't know what the vision is of Christ on our life because we don't spend enough time listening. Maybe we don't know where Christ is trying to lead us or stretch us. Because we want to spend time listening. Well, all we do is spend enough time talking. So in this year, as we treasure Christ, talk to him in prayer, but listen to him as well. Um, look for his presence in leading. Look for it. If, if you're going to treasure Christ, look for him. Uh, ex be expectant in your looking for of him. Uh, look for his presence in things, in conversations, in life, in scripture, uh, with your children. Look for the presence uh, in leading of Christ. Um, and uh, he, here's one of the things I put, uh, make the most of your time. How about we commit to this year of no holding back, right? No holding back. Time is but a vapor. No holding back. Um, it was said, uh, Paul said it this way in first Corinthians. He says, I did not come with super superiority of speech or wisdom, but proclaiming to you the testimony of or the mystery of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He was treasuring Christ. He said, I don't, I'm don't. i not even going to act like I know anything except for Christ and him crucified. Let me leave you with these last final thoughts. John Calvin said this about treasuring Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 2, we're going to make much of Christ. I don't know anything but Christ. I didn't even act like I knew anything but Christ. I know Christ. Wouldn't it be crazy? People would think we were nuts. They'd say those people that go to the grove, they're crazy. They won't talk about anything but Christ. Everything that you talk to them about is about Jesus. Make Jesus part of their conversation. 
here, here's, here's, here's what John Calvin said. There's nothing that Satan so much endeavors to accomplish as to obscure Christ from the believer. Because he knows that by this means the way is opened up for every kind of falsehood. He would go on to say that the only way to combat the obscuring of Christ in your life by Satan, he's obscuring Christ. This is where most Christians live. One foot in, one foot out. Got enough information to be dangerous. You grew up in church, but he doesn't have your heart. He's obscure in your life. He's just kind of a moving target. The only way to combat Satan's ability to obscure Christ in our life is to place Christ before the view such as is he is with all blessings and his excellence my, my excellence may be truly perceived. The only way to treasure Christ and instead of him being obscure, yeah, I'm a Christian, I go to church some, I'm not bagging on you, I'm just telling you, he don't have your heart. Don't tell me he has your heart. Yeah, you're, he, he may have your heart in salvation, but he's not your treasure. You spend more time on all this other kind of stuff. He's not your treasure. He's obscure. He's in and he's out. He's there and he's not. I pray when I need him, but I don't pray when I'm... He's obscure. The only way to keep Satan from winning that battle of obscuring Christ in your life is to place Christ in front of your view. He has got to be the thing you treasure by the thing that you look at. Remember what I talked about at the beginning of this? We're going to keep our eyes up here. The way we do that is by making Christ our view. How do you go make Christ in your daily view? Right here. You ready? This is it. Get up with Jesus. In the morning, get up with Jesus. Get up with Jesus. You want to have a 2021 that's going to be different? You want to treasure Christ? I'm giving you gold here. Get up with him. In the morning time, this means spend time in his word. You know what? It's never been any. I grew up in the day and time when they were talking about doing your devotion. You got to do your daily devotion. My mom used to read the daily devotions because I wouldn't do it. Doing your devotion meant sitting down in the corner, reading your scripture. You may not have time to do all that first thing in the morning, but get up with Jesus. And it's so easy. There's podcasts, there's apps, there's music. Maybe you get up with Jesus by turning on Christian music in your mind immediately, first thing in the mo morning, go straight to Christ. I mean, get up with Him. Uh, get up with Jesus in the morning. Uh, C.J. Mahaney said it this way. He said, preach uh, the gospel to yourself daily. Uh, so you, you may get up running in the morning. You may not have time to sit down. When you get in your truck, when you get in your car, started to wherever, put Jesus on the radio. Put him in your in your podcast. Do whatever you got to do. But there's mo all kinds of ways. Get up with Christ, okay? That's how we're going to keep him in our viewfinder. Number two is this. Make Jesus the focus of your family. Make Jesus Christ the focus of your family. Dads, remember, you're a spiritual leader of your home. Make Jesus the focus of your family. Mamas, remember, you're, uh, you're the one that's going to lead those kids uh, most of the hours every day. Make Jesus the focus of your family. Pray together. Spend time talking about it. Hey, hey dads, moms, don't wait on the Sunday school teacher to talk to your kid about Jesus. Talk to them about Jesus on your own. So we want to make Jesus the focus of our family. You want to raise kids that are generous? Talk to him about being generous because Jesus has made you generous. But make Christ the focus of your family. I want to keep him in the focus of my life. It helps balance everything else out, right? When we're talking about sports and grades and what you're going to be when you grow up, you can't have those conversations without having Jesus in the focus, right? We'll have our kids reaching for something that Christ is not stretching them to. He's trying to stretch them over here. Listen to me. If you have a muscle being stretched in two different directions, that muscle's going to pop. So let's help put Jesus in the viewpoint by making Christ the focus of our family. Um, think in terms, number three, uh, of every moment for Christ's glory. What if this was your thought? I get up with Jesus. He's the focus of my family and every moment for Christ's glory. That changes conversations that I have. I want to look for, for things to talk about Jesus. I want to look at conversations to talk about Jesus. What I buy, where I go. He is the center of Every part of my life, because every moment's for Christ's glory. Now think about yesterday. Was every moment for Christ's glory? What about when you lost it? When you did this? When you, when you made time for that? Was that for Christ's glory? Number four is this. Remo renew your mind daily. <coughs> renew your mind daily. How do you renew your mind daily in Christ? Give thanks. As soon as you get up. As soon as you wake up. As soon as you get that alarm clock for the third time, snooze. As soon as you roll out of bed. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up today. I wonder how many people just like to be waking up today. 
Or no, not how many people just like somebody to be waking up. God, you, you raised me up. I know you got something in store for me today. Uh, replace the negative thoughts as soon as they happen. As soon as they happen, replace that negative thought. That negative thought comes, replace it with a positive thought. Uh, when making your list of the day, give God first priority. I make lists. I, I make lists on what I'm going to do. God needs to be my first priority. What, what, hey, remember what we're talking about? He's going to, here's where he wants to get me to. What's your priority, Jesus, uh, in my life? And then turn your eyes. Listen, as soon as something starts to go wrong in your life, something not going your way, you start feeling yourself getting anxious, start seeing you scrolling on Twitter, going, oh. As soon as something starts to not go your way, turn your eyes to Jesus Christ. Turn your eyes to him and let him lead you through that moment. And the last thing I want to share with you is this. Memorize scripture. We want to treasure Christ. Memorize his word. Now that may be a piece of scripture you want to memorize for a whole month. Just one piece of scripture. Maybe you're just absolutely outstanding. You can do one a day. I don't know. It's hard to do that. But let's memorize scripture. You say, but why is that important? Because if my mind is on scripture, the scripture's on my mind. And if it's on my mind, it's in my heart. And if it's in my heart, it's going to be coming out my mouth and my, my, my thoughts and the things that I do. I want to dwell on the word of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus said, uh, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I ask you this morning, is Christ your treasure? I'm going to pray with you, and I'm so thankful that you joined me. I told you I was going to let you out here early, but I didn't. I, I got excited talking about all this stuff. And, uh, man, I, it was just my honor to be with you this morning. Even though I couldn't see you, you could see me. It feels like we're just having a personal conversation. So let's make it our goal to treasure Christ this year. Let's take all those things that I gave you. And let's keep Christ in the viewpoint, right? But our vision is what we're letting go of and where Christ is stretching us and taking us to. And let's put Christ as our treasure. Let's give him our heart this year. If you give him your heart, it's probably going to up, it's going to up in your priorities in your life. Now, uh, before I pray and let you go, uh, pray for your church family. Pray for all those that are battling COVID and other sicknesses, those who have lost people, those who have had surgery. Pray for uh, JT and Chastity as they battle COVID and their families. A couple other folks that we have on staff that battle COVID. Uh, pray that you would just pray for us so we can get back to being who we are uh, as soon as we possibly can. And let me encourage you to do this. Uh, would you please go to Push Pay and Give today? Um, let's, let's show Christ He's our treasure by our giving. Let's not make Him the last thing that we give to, but let's make Him the first thing that we give to so that He can continue being uh, tangible right here in our community and across the world. I love you very much, and I've never been more proud to be your pastor. And this year, I hope you'll join me as we treasure Jesus Christ. Jesus, I love you. I thank you so much for your word. And I thank you that you have taught us that where our treasures are, that's where our heart will be. It really kind of shows us who we are and why we do what we do, because it's got our hearts. So may we be men and women who make you our treasure. I pray that you bless these tithes and offerings and bless our community. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you very much, and I'll see you next Sunday.